All right, the next question concerns ego and individuated units of consciousness. Are we as free will awareness units here to deal with unbalanced aspects of our individuated unit of consciousness? Also, does our individuated individuated unit of consciousness have some concrete or crystallized fears, beliefs, and expectations that gives us um, its free will awareness unit to work on during individual experience packets? And are our free free will free will awareness units fears just one metaphorical representation of the imbalance or room for improvement with our individuated unit of consciousness? All right, free will awareness unit, individuated unit of consciousness, uh, larger consciousness system, all of those are metaphors. Okay? Um, they're, they're, meta they're functional metaphors. We break things into, into, you know, when we deal with things intellectually, we break things up usually functionally. This does this, this does that, and then we kind of separate them like they're all separate piece parts. Well, they're not. They're, they're just parts of a function, maybe of a whole thing, but we think of it in piece parts because that's easier than trying to just see the whole thing. So that's why we end up with all these various pieces, not because these pieces actually exist, but because these pieces are actual functions that exist within the whole. So, yes, people come, an, an individuated unit of consciousness does indeed incarnate here, which gives them, them the free will awareness unit in this virtual reality. And they do that because they have things to learn, right? You're here to grow up. And if you've, after you've been around a few times, you start to become more specific on how you want to grow up. There may be certain issues that you have that you want to work on. And you will pick a situation with the idea that this is going to help you work on these particular issues, these fears, these problems, these, these things that keep getting in your way of becoming love. So yes, it can be targeted like that, and that, that free will awareness unit has the, being the subset for the people who don't know the terminology lingo, you know, the free will awareness unit is the subset of the individuated consciousness that is aware of the virtual reality. And I know if you're, if you're not used to these acronyms, it's like your head spinning now. But it's just that part of a consciousness that's engaged in being the player in the virtual reality. So the free will awareness unit's the player in the virtual reality. And that player is part of a larger consciousness that is perhaps doing other things. It's collecting all the information from all the players, you know, that it's had and that sort of thing. So it's got, a, it's got some other tasks to do besides just play this game. And the part that's just the player in the virtual reality game we call physical reality, that's what we're calling the free will awareness unit. All right, and that, that part does have a mission to accomplish certain things. Not always, but particularly after you've been in the game long enough, you can get more specific. When you first start the game, you just reincarnate and take whatever you get because you need experience more than anything else. Eventually you grow, and growth isn't always uniform. Sometimes you grow real well in this area, but not so much in that area. And now you need to be more specific, that you need to catch that area that you're deficient in. You need to catch that up. You need a, another set of experiences. Maybe you've been male a whole bunch of times, and you really need to see that from the other side. So you'd like to have a female incarnation in order to get the other side of that, because you're becoming unbalanced with your uh, male-only attitude. You need a little bit of that female uh, perspective to balance you out. So things like that do happen. Now, I'm not, otherwise, I'm not sure I got that question right other than, uh, yes, it does work that way, and uh, we often do come in with very specific agendas of, of particular fears that we want to work on, and the individuated unit of consciousness has kind of planned that out, and the free will awareness unit uh, implements that plan in physical reality. Holly, did I read your question correctly? Did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, yes, Dana, thank you. Um, I think it was almost uh, completely answered, but uh, there's this aspect uh, also related to the previous question. Basically, if everything that happens uh, in our core is this formless feeling, this perception, 
then let's say an imbalance, a room for improvement in our core would say, would be maybe uh, this um, would, be a, would be could be interpreted in many ways. And in our PMR, we would uh, say I have fear from heights, for example. But uh, essentially, it's just a imbalance of energy that could be interpreted in many other uh, ways, maybe in different PMRs. I don't know. And the question was aimed also uh, to ask whether uh, if we go here with this imbalance, it will be a, this concrete fear. If we go somewhere else, it will be manifested in a different way. Or whether it's really concrete and it will be still basically more or less the same thing uh, regardless of where we are going to work with it. Uh, it could be some of both. It's not, all, it's not one or the other. But for the most part, the fear is that you come in with is basic. It's a very basic fear. And that fear could be expressed in any number of different ways. So this, that same basic fear could be, uh, you know, a fear of heights or it could be a claustrophobia, you know, a fear of being enclosed or it could be something else because the fear may be one of insecurity. I feel very insecure. I feel threatened or whatever. And you could be threatened by heights or you could be threatened by being enclosed or you could be threatened by... Uh, you know, agoraphobia, which is fear of the marketplace. You know, you, there are all sorts of ways to express a feeling of being threatened. So your fear may be something's going to get me, something terrible is going to happen to me. And how you express that fear is up to you, you know, and it's just how that happens to come out. So if you have that fear and the very first thing that happens to you is that you run into a great big dog and you're, you know, you're one and a half or two years old, well, that may be it. That fear may manifest as a fear of dogs because you were frightened that that dog was going to eat you for lunch. And that then becomes a, you know, that fear. Whereas if you hadn't run into that dog, maybe you would have found yourself at a high place and had a, had a fear of falling or something. And maybe that would have been it and dogs wouldn't have been it. So it kind of depends. Fears aren't generally that specific. Sometimes they are. If a person is particularly wound up with a, a thing, almost to the point we'd say they are, um, uh, what's the word, uh, when you're terribly focused on something? Um, Obsessive. Obsessed, yeah. If, they, if it's an obsession, something that is so big in their life that it's an obsession, it kind of drives their life. It, it, they're so afraid of heights that they can't even go upstairs in their house. You see, they can't... Uh, you know, they can't go up in an elevator ever. Uh, they don't even like to go up steps. If their house isn't right on the ground floor, they have to go up three steps to get in the house. It bothers them. Well, suddenly, a fear of height that's severe starts to interfere with all the rest of your life. Because in life, we go up and down a little. So, uh, anyway, that then would be maybe an obsession, we could call it that. Then the next time that you incarnate, you may still have a fear of heights because you were so obsessed over that particular fear, you may actually bring that along with you. That's not the rule. That's the exception. The rule tends to be it's just a generalized fear, and you get to make it particular based on your experience and you know how you happen to interpret things at the moment. It, it kind of gets a particular expression. So you have a general thing that you can express in a particular way. Or you may not ever express it particularly. You may just keep it as a general fear of insecurity. You know, you're not afraid of heights or closed places or the marketplace. You just always feel insecure. You always feel like somebody's going to get you. And maybe it never gets specific because no one thing ever jumps out and lets you express it all in that. You know, think of us all as artists and we are expressing ourselves in our being in our free will awareness unit and how our avatar acts. And we're all painting this, this landscape, this picture out of our feelings and how we feel about things, you see. And we could paint that into a fear of heights or we could paint that in just this nebulous fear that something's going to get me and insecurity. It's just the way we happen to express it. You know, we're expressing ourselves into our lifetime, our being, who we are. We do that when we play Sims, when we play World of Warcraft. We express ourselves in the way our elf does whatever he does. If we're very uh, aggressive, we, we always choose to fight every time. 
we lose a lot, you know, we die a lot, we have to go back, but that's what we do. We fight because that seems like what we want to do. And other people will be a lot more cautious than that. They won't fight. Matter of fact, they'll always kind of case the place first and the problem and then run away and think about it and then come back and they're very cautious about the way they do things. It's just an individual expressing themselves in this in this life. So we're all artists kind of painting ourselves into reality through our self-expression, interacting with our environment and uh, with everybody else's intent that we're that we're getting through the network. All of it is a it's really what comes out of us is our own expression of self based on the circumstances in which we're in. So that expression could be one of n different different things based on the circumstances we happen to be at the time when we feel like now's the time to express that. So we're in control. We really do create our own reality. We create uh, much of much of what makes up our life is has been. It's like a painting, our own painting of ourselves, a self-expression of our being in this virtual reality, which is the whole purpose of the virtual reality, that we express ourselves into it and then interact with other people because then we have to express ourselves in that interaction. And in doing so, we define ourselves and create ourselves, and hopefully we do that in a way that lowers our entropy and doesn't raise it. All right, on the same subject of ego and fear, there's, uh, from Polly, there's three parts to this question. Let me rephrase some of it a little bit. Are some fears not related to this PMR? Can fears connected to NPMR somehow trigger the ego here in PMR? And is it really possible to get rid of one's ego in PMR completely? And finally, do you, Tom, still have an ego or fear connected to this PMR or one that is relevant only in MPMR? And if so, can you share or disclose some situation where it gets triggered? Okay. Uh, can we uh, – there's a whole string. You, you, you're taxing an old man's memory. Let's see. Let me when, just do the first part. Uh, are some fears not related to PMR? Yes, some fears are not related here. Some fears we bring with us from other pastimes. And some are could be out of experiences in other reality frames, which to us are non-physical, you know, outside of, of this physical reality. Yes, we are just who we are. All of our experiences lead up to who we are. We have experiences in dreams, right, that are have nothing to do with this reality. We have experiences in dreams, and they can affect us here in this reality frame. So the fears can come from almost any place. Anything that we have found as an experience, whether that experience is in PMR or in dream reality or in some other PMR or just in some other reality frame, if it's an experience of ours, then it has the potential to affect us. And as we change and are affected, we express ourselves differently in every reality that we exist in. When we go out of body, we express ourselves in that reality based on things we've learned and things we've felt and done in this reality and in the dream reality. So Everything affects everything else. Um, yes, so they do come from different sources. It's not just a PMR fear that you get here, you know, stays here. So not a, if it's done in PMR, it stays in PMR. It's not like that. <laughs> it, uh, you are who you are, and you are who you are based on all the experiences you've had in any reality you've ever been in, and all of it affects you, and all of it gets expressed any place you go. So that's, that's sort of that answer. And what was the next one? Did I get is two it, of them in one shot? Is there? it really possible? Uh, <laughs> is it really possible to get rid of one's ego in this PMR completely? Yes, I think it is possible. It doesn't happen very often. You know, there's lots of things that are possible that uh, aren't necessarily common. But yes, you can get rid of your ego completely and become a being of fear. I mean, a being of fear. Yeah, becoming a being of love in this. Uh, in this reality frame, um, I'm sure there are those who have, have done that. Uh, most of us, though, are in a process of trying to do that. And have I completed that process to where I have zero ego? No, I have not you know, completed that, that process. There are things that can uh, annoy me sometimes. There are times when uh, I might feel that uh, 
you know, something is, is not uh, the way it should be or whatever, and it's just me um, projecting the way I think it ought to be rather than necessarily thinking about how it is and why it is that way. And when I do that, I'll often catch myself at it and realize that I'm thinking about this in terms of myself and not in terms of however it came to be what it is. In other words, the same thing we talked about earlier about the sadness in love. You know, you have to you have to get to the point that if you just see it from your own perspective, your dysfunctional family is just a waste. You know, why do they have to fight with each other like that? You know, it's just so unnecessary. You can just see this ego versus ego thing, and it's just completely unnecessary, and it kind of bums you out. Well, that's from your perspective. That's only from your own ego. See, that's your ego, because this is how it affects me. I don't like it. I find it annoying. I find it uh, dysfunctional, so I don't like it. Well, that's ego. That's you expressing ego about it. But then if you step back and say, well, I don't like it, but it's the way they are. They have to be the way they are. They can't be somebody other than the way they are. They have to get there. They haven't made those steps yet. I was there once. I made these steps. I got up to where now I see that as completely dysfunctional. But I remember when I argued and fussed and did all those kinds of things. And I've done this. They have to do it, too, and they have to do it on their own. And then instead of being annoyed with them, you have compassion for them. You want to go up and hug them both and let them fight. You know, let them struggle. Let them do whatever they do with each other because, you know, that's the way they are and they have to do it. And they may do it all the rest of their lives. And you just want to hug them both and, and hope that they figure it out sometime, that there's nothing you can do to intervene or say. It. So you see, the first action is, a, is an ego reaction. Man, this is annoying. Look at those people. Why do they do that? Grow up, folks, you know, just ego. Second reaction is, hey, I love you guys, you know, have a good day. I'm going to go someplace else now. I <laughs> hope maybe you figure this out before I get back, you know, that kind of thing. But it's all in, in caring and it's all in, uh, in that you, you know, it's em in empathy with them rather than as you see it. So I find myself from time to time seeing things, obviously, from my own perspective, reacting to it from my own perspective and then realizing that there's another perspective to see it from. Now, that other perspective may be dysfunctional. It doesn't matter. It's their other perspective. And you have to respect that and let it be. So when somebody is trying to, you know, somebody's trying to take advantage of you, somebody's, you know, doing things or trying to steal, trying to get away with things, you know, you, you hire people to fix something and they don't really fix it. They just pretend to fix it and they give you a big bill. You take your car in and they just let it sit in the lot and then charge you $400 and tell you that they changed oil and they didn't do anything, you know, those kinds of things. They can aggravate you. But you also realize that this is just a part of life. You know, life is like that. There are people like that, and you have to deal with them. And if you don't have the, you know, if you don't have a, a good way to deal with them, then you just have to suck it up and go on and not be, up, not be angry, not, uh, you know, go punch them out or anything like that, not do whatever. You may take your business elsewhere. You may not call them the next time to do whatever. But you just have to let them be. You have to not get angry. You have to not think that they are subhuman, you know, whatever's that, you know, need to be, you know, put in jail. You basically realize that life's like that. You deal with people like that and you deal, you know, you deal with it gracefully because you have to. If you went around and put everybody in jail that you disagreed with, it would only be you left, you know, and uh, it wouldn't be any fun anymore. So that's... Those kinds of things. And that happens to me, too. But typically, it's I catch it fairly well. And if I don't catch it, my wife will. And she will, she will inform me. So uh, that's a good thing about a wife. They always catch those things uh, immediately, particularly if she's the one that's on the other end. So, uh, yes, I've got things to learn. And it's, you know, I don't have a lot of fears like I had, you know, when I was, a young child, I, like most young children, you know, I, I knew there was a boogeyman under the bed, right, and one hiding in the closet, too. 
but you get over those kinds of things and eventually you realize, well, if there is, there is, you know, nothing I can do about that. You know, if boogeyman appear under my bed, then you accept it and you go on and you get up out of the bed and you go to the bathroom and you do what you have to do and figure, okay, boogeyman, take your best shot. You know, I got to do this and I'm going to do it and the chips will fall where they do. You know, you eventually get to that point where it's not so scary anymore. You just go through life, do the best you can, let the chips fall where they may. And if those chips happen to, happen to wipe you out or, you know, the boogeyman grabs you, then that happens. You know, you've got another lifetime coming after that. Maybe next time you'll be luckier. Uh, you know, you just, the bigger your picture is, the less you worry about the details, I guess is a way to say it. As your decision space gets bigger and bigger and your reality gets bigger and bigger, the details seem less and less important. So when you are have a little reality, whether the boogeyman grabs you and, and eats you, you know, overnight is a really, really big deal in a little reality. In a bigger reality, eh, you know, I'll always come back again. You know, we'll do something else next time. And then it's not so bad to have these, you know, people who rip you off or take advantage or do other things that they do, kind of the boogeyman in the adult world, right, that they're always out there trying to get you. Um, you just kind of deal with it a grain of salt. It's just not that big a deal in your life. So that's kind of the way we all grow up in that. But it's a gradual process. And do, does anybody ever get to the point where they, uh, they never see things from their own perspective? They always see the general big picture perspective? I think it's possible. Sure, you get there. I see myself progressing, you know, over time. But uh, the instances in which you deal from ego just get fewer and fewer and less and less important. You know, they, they become small things that aren't really major things. They're not uh, causing a lot of problems. It's just you find yourself looking at a looking at a problem the wrong way for a while before you look at it the right way. Continuing on with relationships, um, Polly asks, um, how, how much should he involve people close to him in his journey to grow up? <laughs> well, you know, this, this works real well with the last question. You know, I would say if you want to know what you're doing wrong, if you want to know why your ego is leading, there's one thing that you can always do that will, that will Ensure that you find out very quickly. Get married. Get a girlfriend. Get a boyfriend. Because they will tell you, they will tell you because you interact with these people at a very deep level. You see, most of the people we interact with, we interact very superficially. Now we've got 20 people we know at the office. We interact with them every day, but it's always superficial. We don't interact with them deeply as individuals. You know, they, have, they go home to their own house and their own kids and their own life, and we're not a part of any of that. So we don't really interact with them. We show them our professional side. They show us their professional side, and we go and we, inter we interact and we do business, and everything's fine. But with a significant other, you know, a wife, a husband, and your children, and all the people you're close with, perhaps your parents, you know, these are people that you know in great depth. And these are the people who are likely to, you know, you to, uh, you are likely to, you know, uh, use your ego and your fear and all sorts of things in your interaction with them because you're interacting with them in depth. The real you comes out. It's not the professional you at the office. This is the real you that lives at home. So you interact with these people and they know immediately that you're coming at them with ego or you're coming at them out of fear or you're coming at them uh, from you know a self-centered viewpoint it's perfectly obvious to them because they're also in a deep connection with you you don't notice it because that's just the way you are if you're acting angry well you're justified if you weren't justified you wouldn't be angry you know that's obvious so there's nothing wrong with my anger it's perfectly justified you see whereas that other person that's on the brunt of your anger they can tell you right away that nothing justifies anger. See, not that anger you know, is not justified. So they can tell you that. So that's one of the great advantages of a significant other, be it a, you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, or, or even if, it, again, it's your children, it's your parents, all the significant people that are close to you in your life, they can tell you when you're being you know, egotistical, when you're coming out of, 
out of fear. When you're trying to dominate and get things the way you want them, regardless of the way anybody else wants them, you say that it's my way, you know, do it my way, I'm in charge here, I'm in control, everybody must obey, you know, you're kind of coming on from that viewpoint. They get that very loud and clear, and eventually they'll have the courage to tell you. And then you have to have the good sense to listen, <laughs> not to deny it all and, you know, pour more ego back out. So it's in these relationships is where we are most directly challenged. Um, you know, that's true for most of us. How we treat our kids, you know, how we treat our significant other. These are our big challenges where our ego is most evident. And, you know, and that's good. In a way, that's, that makes it difficult. That makes these relationships more difficult because we, we don't show just a professional shallow image of ourselves. You know, that's not very satisfying in a relationship. It's good for business, but it's not very personally satisfying. So we do let it all hang out at home in the sense that we act exactly the way we are, and then there it is. You know, there's that, that ego right out on the table, and all your significant people in your life will see it you know, and feel it, and eventually they will tell you about it and object to it, and the key is not to deny it and give them more of the same. The key is to listen to them and try to see it from their perspective. How, do, how would it feel if you were, you know, in their spot and they were in your spot? And if you can get that, then you can get over a lot of your ego at home. That's a great place to learn. But that's the key is, is when they tell you that you're, you know, you're coming on uh, in a way that they don't like, makes them feel bad. They don't have to tell you, oh, it's your ego. They can just say, you know, I don't, you know, what you're saying makes me feel bad. Then instead of saying, well, then you're ridiculous if it makes you feel bad. Does the truth make you feel bad? You know, this sort of thing. Well, that's just more ego, right? That's just proving the point that they're making. You're proving it, but you're denying what they're saying and, and, and shoveling more gasoline under the fire. So that's the key, is when somebody tells you something like that, you need to stop and say, let me see this from another perspective. Let me look at it from their point of view. Let me stop my point of view and imposing my point of view on everybody else. So that's the key place. You know, where do you, you know, where's the, where's the, uh, the hardest, the toughest class in the school is in your house. That's where the toughest class in the school is, and it's mainly with your significant other, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, you know, whatever. It's the people closest to you. That's where the, that's where the rubber really meets the road for most of us, and I'm no exception to that. And Pamela's good. She's very good at uh, telling me immediately if I'm uh, coming from a <laughs> isn't healthy, as she should be. That's why I love her. She's very good. Along the same lines, um, an often asked question and seldom answered, could you please share something about your unique journey here? <laughs> hmm, my unique journey here. Well, you know, everybody has a unique journey here, so I would start out by saying my unique journey here is, is uh, it's sort of like everybody else has a unique journey here. We start, we have some goals and things that we want to accomplish, and we begin struggling toward that accomplishment. And I've done the same thing. I've had a few things that I was supposed to do in this uh, incarnation, this reality frame, uh, things that I've been led toward, and, and I, you, you get that more in looking back than you get at looking forward. Looking forward, it's just all a bunch of choices, and you just have to take your best shot and make the best choices you can. There's not a lot of guidance there. But when you look back, you can often see how you were nudged, how this happened and that happened, uh, that kind of pushed you along a particular developmental road, and then you realize that all that wasn't just by accident. You know, this is a road that you need to go down, that you were meant to go down. This is part of a plan, and you can you can see the continuity in it as time goes by. So the older you are, the more likely you're able to look back and see some kind of pattern to what's been going on. 
often it's a pattern to the problems you're making, you know, the, the problems you've created for yourself. Oh, this was a problem, and that's a problem, and this was a problem. That may cover four decades, and you look at it, and you say, oh, they're all the same problem. <laughs> you know, I keep repeating, you know, this problem, you know, this this anger management thing. I had, it got me in trouble when I was in kindergarten. It got me in trouble when I was in middle school. It got me in trouble when I was in high school. got me thrown out of college. You know, I, I lost my, my first job because of it, and you start looking at this this process, and you can see that there's a, but there's a pattern here, and that's very valuable for you to, to look at because that's kind of the thing you're here to, to learn, and it keeps coming up, and then maybe you keep failing, you know, the lesson, and then maybe one day you learn it, and you say, oh, from that point on, my life got so much uh, better, you see. So anyway, one of the things I came here to do uh, was what I'm doing, you know, was, was with these books, that uh, I was to write with the with the my big toe to you know the fact that I just happened to run into Bob Monroe and he just happened to be looking for a few scientists and I just happened to be on the right spot at the right time and I went out there and I just happened to be a natural for meditation and all these kinds of things that just happened to fall together at the right time in the right place and I also was a physicist so I could see you know I had a foot in both worlds I was in the material reductionist camp I was also doing out of body at the same time. And I could kind of look at connections and see where these things met. And I could do physics in, in the larger reality system. And all of that stuff wasn't just, you know, gee, you know, that just all just happened that way by random. It was just a chance. It didn't. That was that was engineered. That was led. You could say it was nudged. You know, there's no predestination. But you have things you're trying to do, and, and the system will nudge you on that path to doing them. And I can look back and feel the nudges, you know, recognize the nudges I had that pushed me along that got me to where I am. And part of it was to synthesize both the science and the metaphysical, you know, the physics and the metaphysics, to synthesize that into one bigger picture and overview of something. So that's been on my agenda for a long time. And when I started on this path, I was mostly a right-brained individual. That was the way I came in. I was very right-brained. My task was to learn the left brain part of it and then synthesize the two. So I already came in with the right brain part of it. I came in and meditation, those kinds of things were easy. You know, my sister will tell you stories of me at, you know, seven or eight years old chanting, you know, and going into, you know, going into, uh, you know, Never Never Land or basically being out of, out of touch in this reality, you know, chanting to myself. So I came in with a right brain. Um, understanding of the world, very holistic, saw things in, in big pictures, understood things, had non-physical connections all along, and they seemed perfectly normal to me. Um, then I had to develop the left brain part while I was here. I had to get that up to a, a level that was equal to the right brain part, so that's when I was pushed into science get into science, get into technology, you know, do these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, when I was real little, I was going to be an automobile mechanic, and then I was going to fly airplanes, you know, and then I was going to be a scientist and so on. But math for me was hard, you know. I uh, just didn't get it. I had a hard time with math. I was a right-brainer. I could intuit the result much better than I could figure it out through the steps. And I struggled with it. But the more I struggled with it, eventually I saw the bigger picture of it. I didn't just, I gave up trying to see how you turned the crank to get the answer and started seeing what it meant in a bigger picture. What was the significance? What was the logic behind the math? What did it tell you about, you know, reality, which is why I go into physics, because physics basically is a mathematical modeling of reality. So that's a very left brain a uh, logical process kind of thing. So that's why I had to be a physicist. And I struggled with it. And eventually, somewhere probably in graduate school, I got it. And it all got very easy. And then I could, you know, the math then started to be simple. I could see the concepts. I could see the bigger picture in it. And I could work with it very well. And then it wasn't that far out of graduate school. Uh, where I ran into Bob Monroe and all the rest of it went that way. But first I had to be 
the physicist first, and not only a physicist, but a good one, one that could think in terms of math rather than in terms of language. And uh, that then gave me the ability to do this other work that I could do. So I can see this, this these events, you know, coming to some conclusion in the long term. So doing my books, coming up with this theory was, was something that I was focused toward and nudged toward, um, you know, from the from the beginning. Matter of fact, uh, tell a story. When I was in graduate school, um, I had uh, I'd already had the master's degree, and I then was working on a PhD. And I had done my all my coursework for the PhD was done. I took my qualifying exam, and that was passed. And I uh, just had to do the research and publish the paper. So I got into doing research, and I worked on a on a uh, low energy accelerator and doing nuclear experimental nuclear physics. And I wrote the paper and I was in a, I was feeling pushed, very pushed to, to get out, you know, and you, you kind of feel that as like you're, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, you know, you're, you're overworked. You've pushed so long and so hard to get something done and you're, and you're done with it. Uh, what's the term for that? Burnout, you know, but I was feeling that kind of a burnout, but it wasn't so much of being burnt out as it was being, driven to get this done. And I don't know why I was so driven at the time. I didn't know why. I do now. I had to get this done, and it had to be done right away. So I worked hard. I worked very hard at it, and I got all my research done, got the paper written for my thesis. I said, I passed all the tests. I passed everything. And I take it to my major professor, and I hand him the paper, and I said, it's done. You know, here's my research. Here's the results and conclusions. All the data and everything's here. You know, let's, because, of course, the major professor has to approve it and everything else. And then you send it away and you get it published. And that's the process. So I hand it to him and he looks at it and he says, good, that's really good work. Uh, we'll get that published in such and such a place. And uh, you should be thinking about what you're uh, going to do next. And I'm thinking, I know what I'm going to do next. I'm out of here. You know, and I've got a connection I have to make. I don't know what it is, but I got to go. And uh, he said, "No, no." He said, "What you gonna the next the next uh, paper you're gonna write?" And I said, "The next paper I'm gonna write? What do you mean the next paper I'm gonna write?" And he says, "Oh, look, you've already got this all set up. You got you know, oh, you're just gonna change the target. So instead, of, I think it was uh, sodium 21 nucleus. I was looking at. We'll look at a different nucleus. You run through the same process." And you'll create another paper. It's just easy to do. You know, in a year you'll be done. Less. You know, it's not a big deal. And you get two papers out of it. And I said, I don't want to do two papers. So I did a paper. I got a thesis. I'm gone, right, Doc? And he says, Nope. You got to do another one. And I said, I'm out of here. Bye. Gone. So I got a job. There were no jobs around for me. I looked. No jobs. Physicists were not employable right at that time. It was in a depression, kind of what we call it, recession. And uh, there were no jobs available, but I had to go anyway. And what happened? Well, there was this job that I knew somebody who knew somebody who could use somebody like me, but there wasn't really a job, so they'd make one, and they'd open it up. And I just happened to apply right on the day they opened it up, and I got the job. I'd sent out 50 resumes before this and got nothing. Well, I did. I got two replies back. Neither one did I like the sound of it. So this job just opened up right in the hometown I happened to be in. So I took the job. Within a couple of months, I got handed Bob Monroe's book. With another month after that, I met Bob Monroe, and I started on my, my journey on the other half of my occupation, which is the study of consciousness. And that situation had to happen then. It wasn't going to happen some other time. If I'd taken any of those other jobs or stayed in graduate school, that whole situation would have been missed, you see. So I had this push. It's time for you to get out of graduate school. You've got to go out and get in the world because there's something else that's waiting for you out there to do, so move it, you know. So I turned my major professor down. I refused to do the extra paper. I did not get my PhD. I just had a master's degree. I did all the work for a PhD, including the thesis, but I never actually collected a PhD. So that's kind of a, a story about how you get nudges to go someplace and do something. That's kind of a path you've got, connections you have to make, 
And it wasn't until later that I could put that together. All I knew is that I couldn't do another paper. I had to leave. I had to get out into the real world and find a job. Now, that's not rational. You know, I spent, what, six and a half years in graduate school to get this PhD, and I had only another six months to a year to do what my major professor wanted and have a, a second research paper, and then a degree would have been handed to me. But I decided to leave after all of that investment and not get the PhD. So that would sound like a very irrational thing, but it's, I was driven very strongly to do that. There was no other choice that I could make. That had to be the choice. And then I see this blip, blip, blip. All the other dominoes fall after that, and my life changes totally. It would not have been the same had I not made that connection. Well, that connection was in the wings kind of waiting for me, and I was being nudged to do that. And this is the time I was expected to have graduated, but my major professor threw a what do they say, through a wrench in the monkey works, right? He messed it up by saying, oh, you know, how about grinding out another paper that I get my name on, you know, as well as you get your name on it, and that'll be another paper for me too. What a good idea. You know, and <laughs> no, I just don't want to go there. Sorry, boss, but I can't go there for some reason, and I left. So that was a, you know, a big life decision that I got nudged into going that direction because that was part of the plan. And I needed to go, I needed to make that get, I needed to make that job that was just occurring right under my nose, right at that moment. And I just, and I needed to then get that connection to Bob and all of that was set up as highly probable. So in the future probable database, all that was set up as the pathway that was most probable for me to get nudged to work. And so what I got was this, this uh, kind of, an irresistible urge that I needed to leave. I was done with graduate school. I had done it, and I was done, so I left. So that's the thing. Um, you know, talking about my story and you know how I went along. That's just the way it is when you kind of have a mission to do. You get nudged, and those nudges in this time, you know, just made a huge difference. And I wouldn't regret a bit of it. You know, I don't, re I don't uh, regret any of it. I found through my working life that not having a PhD has probably more benefit than having one because of the way that I, where I worked. I worked in industry. I didn't work in academia. If you're going to work in academia, you have to have a PhD. It's very important. You know, that's the key thing. If you work in industry, whether you have a PhD or not, may make a small difference in your starting pay, but where you happen to end up five years later is totally, completely dependent upon what you produce. What can you do? How much money do you make for the company on the bottom line? You know, how good are you at pulling your weight? And those who have PhDs that don't really pull their weight and don't do much, they sink like rocks, and those that don't have advanced degrees but really produce, they rise like stars. So it really doesn't matter. The one thing, you know, you, you go up based on what you can do, and uh, I didn't have any trouble producing, so I did real well. But I found out that when they want somebody to, and what they say in the trade is, be a show dog, in other words, they want someone to look good and impress people. They look for somebody with a Ph.D. and say, oh, here's Dr. Smith, and he's our representative. You know, so they pull people up for these show dog jobs where they represent the company and try to look as important as possible, but they don't really have much to do other than as a conduit passing data back. They're kind of a, a good-looking dog, you know, so we call them a show dog. Those are jobs that I would not want. And I didn't get those jobs because I didn't have the PhD. There aren't that many PhDs, at least in the engineering firm I was in. So the ones with PhDs often got pulled up to do the to be show dogs. I like doing the real work, which is where the you know which where the excitement was. And basically I did well with it, so I got promoted quickly and went up. And I had people on my staff that had PhDs that didn't, weren't doing all that well and you know, didn't succeed that much in the company. So in a, in a company that has to make a profit based on their products, what you can produce 
is the key ingredient, not what degree you have. So I found that it was fine. I really didn't didn't miss it at all. In fact, sometimes I was really glad that I didn't have it because I wanted to duck out of those uh, those jobs that were mostly politics and not science. You know, they, they weren't the kind of things that were fun. Politics is not a fun thing to do, at least not for me anyway. So it wasn't anything I ever regretted uh, making that decision. So that's a little bit about my life and how I, you know, how I got to this part. Now I will say that at the same time I had other other functions as well in the non-physical. Um, and NPMR had other things that other jobs as assigned that were also uh, significant for me. And those I choose not to talk about, but they probably are import as important, if not more important, than the things I do here. But being here was a really good cover for the things that I had to do there. It's a really good place to be in. So it, it all it worked out at all at all angles, in all directions. So that uh, that's kind of my story. It, uh, I guess it's a it's a good example of uh, how one can sometimes seem like randomly, you know, bounce from thing to thing through life. But as you look back at it, you can see the purpose in those random bounces and they weren't really random at all. You know, why was I so irrational as to walk out on the PhD with just another six months to a year worth of work? Well, once I look back at it, I wouldn't have changed it for anything. You know, and missed that connection and gone on. I'd have just been some other physicist, you know, doing physics and whatever. I wouldn't have had all the rest of the richness in my life that I had because I didn't go that route, you know, because I did go on and get a job and ended up out at Monroe Laboratories and so on. Made a huge difference. Go with the flow, you know. If you're if you're acting irrationally about something, maybe there's a reason. If you tend to be a rational person, you know, maybe there's some some method to the madness going on behind the scenes that you just ought to flow with it. Well, when you were at Bob Monroe's, uh, Pally asks about some of the Seth works. I know you did some studying of uh, Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts. Um, what he's asking here is concerned with sleep patterns, sleep and eating patterns, some of the uh, information that came out of the Seth books had to do with that, the two-phased sleep pattern and also uh, the uh, food patterns as well. Do you recall any of that from the Seth books? And um, The Seth books didn't really uh, create any or didn't really uh, instigate or, or uh, weren't the catalyst for, for any uh, of the sleep or eating changes. I didn't really have too many sleep changes other than I didn't get much. That was probably the biggest change for me is that I didn't get a whole lot of sleep in those time, in those days. But because I had a full-time job, of course, I'm doing physics. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working as a physicist, uh, well, more than eight hours a day. I was working probably, you know, at least 10 hours a day as a physicist. And then I was spending my evenings with Bob Monroe. So we We'd, uh, I'd get off work, I'd go pick up Dennis, we'd go out to the lab, we'd get back at, you know, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd lie in bed, practice the kind of stuff that we had learned until about 6, and I'd sleep from 6 to 6.30, and then I'd get up and get ready to go to work, you know, it was one of those things, so there wasn't a lot of sleeping in those days. Fortunately, in those meditative states, you get a lot of energy back, and the body can kind of rest while you're off doing other things with your mind, but it was a bit of a crazy uh, high energy time anyway. Um, let's see, where were we? Uh, oh, Seth Speaks. When I was initially, you know, I was the physicist of the group there, and that makes me the theoretician. You know, Dennis was uh, an engineer, so he was, he was more of the practical application, building equipment, that kind of thing. So we kind of had our specialties, and I was reading anything that I could get that would give me some way to kind of organize a basis on which to make a structure that, that made the things that we were doing make sense. So it was just out of um, 
a little out of desperation and a, and a little out of like, like you always start a project with a literature search. You know, you read everything that you can find on a subject first. So I read all sorts of books, every book that had out of body mentioned, which then was called astral projection in most of the books. So I read four or five books on astral projection that was probably written in the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, uh, read things, um, was the guy, uh, Man Visible and Invisible, uh, the uh, Ledbetter, C.W. Ledbetter, wrote books about auras. And, so I read everything that I could think of that was uh, metaphysical, um, because there was no physics that you know, had anything to do with conscious or whatever. There was, a, there was a big barrier between the two. And then I came across Seth Speaks, and Seth Speaks was the first book that had that was approaching the subject of metaphysics from a left brain viewpoint, tried to approach it logically. You know, Seth speaks was, here's how it works, here's why it works, and here's what's going on. And to me, that was great. That was at least some place to start. But when you read Seth speaks, you also realize that it's really hard to understand exactly what Seth was getting at a lot of the times. You know, after all, this is a channeled thing, and Jane had to get the concepts and ideas, filter them as we just discussed earlier, by Jane's knowledge and Jane's, you know, fears and Jane's understanding and Jane's experience in the language. And then they had to make sense. And some of it, it kind of almost made sense. But then when you really thought about it hard and tried to, you know, make it completely logical, well, it didn't actually make sense. So it was one of those things that, that uh, was the closest and the best theory that we had to relate consciousness to the physical reality, but it still was pretty empty of close connections. You know, it didn't really connect you into the, you know, between the not the, the metaphysical and the physical world. It was not really connected too, too closely. It was kind of airy philosophy, if you will. It wasn't real tightly done, and there's some of it didn't didn't work right. In a section where Jane interpreted Seth as, um, you know. Everything happens at the same time. There is no time. Everything, you know, that that just wasn't right. You know, it just didn't compute at all. So there were some things that just weren't right, and some things that were sounds kind of right, but I'm not exactly sure what he meant. But it was the best we had. There wasn't anything out there that was any better than Seth Speaks at that time, trying to explain how you know the larger reality worked. By then, I knew there was a larger reality. I just didn't know how it worked. And I didn't know what the, the constraints were, the limitations, the boundaries, what you could do and couldn't do. And Seth Speaks was a starting point. So we kind of took in Seth Speaks, but understood its limitations. And that was uh, kind of my first starting point, if you will, to uh, have Seth, point, Seth Speaks as a, as a philosophical starting point from which you could go out from there to see if you couldn't explain it better, if you couldn't explain it in a way that was more logical, made more sense, it was tighter logical connections between things, um, and some of the things, like I say, were just not were just not quite right. And I understand why Jane said that. She was just confusing the databases. You know, she got. I think what her, what Seth was telling her was that. You had the future in the future probable database. You had the past and all the past databases. And at any time, you could you could access with your intent the past or the future. It was all there, available for you now, past, future, and everything. And she interpreted that as they're all existing at the same time. Well, they are. The two databases and you are existing in the present, and you can access all of that, and you can do it now. And you can kind of see where she might have interpreted that the wrong way, and I think that's probably what happened there. But I hear that all over the place. I mean, that little line out of Seth Speaks has infiltrated the minds of hundreds of thousands of people, all sorts of different uh, metaphysical things, and you hear that a lot. Oh, there is no time, you know, it's all, you know, and it's just like, that doesn't compute, folks. You know, it, it, uh, it's just not the way it is. Yes, time is local to this virtual reality. We have our own time because we have our outer delta T loop that's going around, and it's not necessarily the same time as some other reality frame. They have their own delta T loop going around, but time is real. 
and what's past is past. What's future hadn't happened yet. It's not a done deal. And definitely there is time and there is this arrow of time that, that uh, goes from past to future. And all the action happens in the present. Everything that makes a difference is in the present. The future is probabilistic. The past is also. The past as well, it's what you actually did, plus it's the, everything it could have done and the probability. So Jane got that confused, I think. And uh, in any case, Sispeaks was a, was a breath of fresh air. Finally, somebody was trying to explain how does it all work? Why does it work? And they were doing it from a left brain process. It's just that it was airy and full of holes and a few errors out. Now, again, but I really enjoyed Sespeaks. It's a laborious book to read. People say the same about mine, but uh, I found it a laborious, uh, laborious book to read uh, because it was very difficult to understand what he meant. You know, you are a multidimensional self. Well, that's right. You know, I, I agree with that one. But when you're when you don't understand it yet, trying to comprehend, well, what does that mean? I am a multidimensional self. You know, okay. What does that mean? What can I do with that? You know, what can I make of that? What limitation or what advantages does that give me? And then there weren't any answers for any of that. You see, the answer, I mean, the thing was just a, you are a multidimensional entity. True enough, but it's not enough to build science on. You can't make science out of, out of, out of uh, statements like that. So Seth was a platform to launch from and to find out a lot of other things. And a lot of what Seth said was, was right. You know, he had a lot of it right, but it was more poetry and assertion than it was logical derivation. I wanted a logical derivation. I'm a physicist. So what we do, we start with basic principles, and we derive the logical consequences of those basic principles. That's the way physics works. And that's what I wanted to do in consciousness. And Seth really didn't start from basic principles and derive everything. He just stated the way it was. And that was helpful, but not really what I wanted to do. So that's kind of my interaction with, uh, with Seth Speaks and Jane Roberts.